Our expert interview today will be with Dr. John Allen, who will share his perspective on emotion elicitation. Dr. Allen received his PhD from the University of Minnesota and is currently a distinguished professor of psychology, cognitive science, and neuroscience at the University of Arizona. Dr. Allen is a renowned expert in emotional elicitation, and he's co-edited a handbook on this very topic. He's well known for research involving psychophysiological tools to understand the origin and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders. He's published over 120 scientific papers, received numerous grants and awards for his research that include the Early Career Award from the Society for Psychophysiological Research, and importantly, has a deeply embedded passion for teaching. This has been reflected in the Graduate College and Professional Education Teaching and Mentoring Award and designation as a University Distinguished Professor. And in addition to his expertise in emotion and emotional elicitation, he's also an avid mountain biker and unicyclist. So I'd like to welcome Dr. John Allen, who will be speaking with today on emotional elicitation. So I'd like to begin with what first got you interested in the study of emotion. So could you tell us a bit about what first sparked your interest in the field? Sure. You know, as far back as I can remember, I was interested in people's emotions. Uh, and one of the things I remember thinking often as a, you know, an adolescent was I'd watch people make decisions that they seemed to have reasons for that didn't correspond to what I saw the reasons were for the decision they made. Mm -hmm. You know, in my mind, I thought, this looks like an emotional decision to me, and they'd come up with all kinds of reasons for the reasons that they thought that they did it. And it kind of got me interested in how decision-making is driven in large part by emotion, and emotions that we may or may not be aware of, and we may or may not be aware of their influence on the kinds of decisions that we make. And so when I was in college, I took a few courses on emotion. At this point, I didn't know that this would be a field of study for me. It was just something of interest. And uh, the first course was a course on the philosophy of emotions where I guess ironically we spent a lot of time thinking about emotions. And then I took a course from uh, Howard Leventhal. Uh, it was a course on the psychology of emotion, you know, a large 300 or 400 level course. It was amazing that it was offered and he would walk through study after study on perspectives of emotion. And then finally I was fortunate enough while at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, to take my first psychophysiology course from Richie Davidson who had just mm -hmm. arrived. And so those three courses, you know, really got me interested in emotion and multiple perspectives on emotion. And, you know, I realized this was a topic that was important. It was a topic that was complex, and it was a topic that was far from fully understood. And so aside from the intrinsic interest, that certainly suggested the kind of topic that might lead to job security. Excellent. And I mean, since then, you've just done so much amazing research in the field of emotion. So I'd love to just ask you a few questions now about your research. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you've co-edited one of the most widely read handbooks in our field, the Handbook of Emotional Elicitation. So, I'd love to hear, in your opinion, what you think are some of the most effective or powerful tools for really triggering these, you know, really uh, fascinating and intense feelings of emotion that we experience. Sure. Well, you know, there are a lot of good elicitation techniques mm -hmm. for use in the laboratory and studies of emotion. Mm -hmm. And I think those that are the most potent are those that involve some form of social interactions. I think they have the greatest resemblance to the majority of our real world emotional experiences. But I think really the big challenge is trying to increase the intensity and the realism and the ecological validity of the elicitation of emotion. So, you know, I think about even the best that we do in the laboratory, it really doesn't compare to what we see, you know, in just quotidian life. We have you know, instances of road rage and you know, um, romantic jealousy, um, interpersonal conflict, or even just the kind of intense emotion you see at a major sporting event. Um, these are the kinds of emotions that I really think, you know, we need to try to study when possible. And it's so far, you know, that's difficult to do in the laboratory, but clearly those kinds of manipulations that involve interactions with other people are those, I think, that get the closest to that. Um, you know, this kind of, as I was thinking about this, um, it, it leads me to a provocative and maybe a hyperbolic proposition that is what we really study in the laboratory is mild emotion or we study the inhibition of a regulation of anything that gets a little stronger than mild emotion. And so, you know, I'm, I'm surely overstating the case, but I think that disentangling whether we're looking at the experience of emotion or are we looking at the regulation of 
that experience of emotion is very difficult, right? Are we looking at emotion or regulation or inhibition of emotion? And that's probably surprisingly tricky. It sounds like that might be an important next step is to really try to develop tools that can elicit and try to disentangle these two constructs. If I think can. that would be an important step. Yes, yeah. definitely. And there's there's a large, re, you know, there's a large program of research going on on emotion regulation, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't really get at this question either. Yeah. So what do you see then as some of the critical next steps when we think about developing tools for emotion elicitation going forward? Um, you know, I think probably uh, this is going to be to increase, increase the, the realism that we have and move this into um, real world contexts. Yeah. So kind of increasing the ecological validity using like the social dynamic tasks you're talking about, interacting with another person, maybe getting into the car when someone's experiencing road rage. Well, I think, yeah, with the, yeah, with the increased availability of ambulatory assessment tools, psychophysiological or otherwise, I think a lot of this would you know, be within our grasp within a few years. So there's been a lot of work improving ambulatory psychophysiological monitoring systems, for example, um, other forms of ambulatory assessment. There's now a society for uh, ambulatory assessment um, that involves psychophysiology and, and other kinds of methods. Um, you know, in this, in this domain, I'd like to also give a shout out to Scott McCaig. He's got something that he calls MOBI, the Mobile, mobile Brain Body Imaging. And although he doesn't study emotion, um, he has a system where people can walk around, he can record 64 or 128 channels of EEG while they freely roam an environment. Wow. And he can keep track of what they're looking at, where, how they're moving, where they are, what's going on in the scene, and all of the data stream is merged. Wow, that's fascinating. And so thinking more about uh, emotional elicitation tools, I mean, you've specialized in using really complex and very cool uh, psychophysiological tools uh, in studying emotion. So what would your thoughts be on some of the most powerful or provocative tools you've used in your own research? Well, you know, with psychophysiological research, a lot of this depends on tight temporal control over the stimuli. And so there's this tension between, on the one hand, um, the need for such experimental control, and on the other hand, presenting the kind of complex, intense emotional elicitors that probably unfold over time. Um, so if we try to focus on more discrete elicitors of emotion, I think films can really serve that purpose pretty well. It's, a, it's, a, it's something with which people are generally familiar. Um, it's possible to generate some pretty intense emotion, but we're still talking about a time scale, of course, that spans seconds to minutes. So if we're looking for really discrete responses to kind of a transient effective response, then, you know, something like the International Affect Picture Series, the, the picture system, the IAPS, is certainly well suited, it's industry standard. Um, but, you know, if I were on the Motion Picture Rating Committee, I'd give the IAPS a PG-13, and I'd really like to see us come out with an R-rated or an NC-17 rated version of the IAPS. You know, we'd have to be thoughtful and sensitive about the people to whom we expose uh, to those stimuli, but, you know, I certainly think that the average college student has seen things that make the IAPS seem rather tame. Um, you know, another way you can get around the timing issue and get back to having a potent emotion elicitor is to use some kind of complex and realistic emotion elicitation strategy that then creates an affective state that endures for some time and then you can assess what you're interested in during that time interval. Um, or when, you know, when the person is or is not experiencing emotion. So for example, we've used a social evaluative threat manipulation. Um, in this kind of manipulation, people experience an uncontrollable situation. The experimenter provides overt feedback that there's failure going on. Um, we leave the door to the psychophys chamber open. We sit there with our white coats. It's a little bit like a Trier experience, but instead of them giving a speech, they're performing the task on the computer. And we've done this in the context of basic performance monitoring tasks and reinforcement learning tasks and looking how emotional stress impacts people's ability to monitor their own performance and make decisions. Um, and another example of that, of creating an effective state that might endure for a while, um, I think is really nicely exemplified by work that Eddie Harmon Jones does. So he, in one of his paradigmatic ways, he makes people angry. And I have to say, Eddie's really good at making people angry in the laboratory. So he has like an experimental confederate come in, and the confederate says something that's insulting to the subject about some aspect of their performance or their beliefs. And then he assesses physiology in the interval that follows, during which the person is presumably continuing to feel some kind of emotion. Fantastic. So, I mean, I'm thinking a bit, too, about your own work here, where you've really use these complex psychophysiological tools to 
um, probe and delve into who might be at the greatest risk for developing depression and anxiety. I know this is a topic important to many people. Um, and so what do you see as the most critical discoveries in this line of work? Right. Yeah, you know, it, it is an interesting and important topic and it, it links to normal emotion because we can look at the kind of pathological variants mm -hmm. of emotion or failures of emotion regulation. Um, you know, our, our work has encompassed, as you said, depression and anxiety, and we've focused really on, on primarily two different sets of measures, one of them being frontal EEG symmetry, and the other looking at cardiac vagal control as a measure of parasympathetic nervous system flexibility and function. So with respect to the EEG symmetry, um, I would say that the biggest uh, contributions lately have been refining the measure, both in terms of its temporal and its spatial resolution. So the fact that I end up studying EEG asymmetry probably stems from the fact that I took my first psychophysiology course from Richie Davidson. Um, and the measure has just kind of traveled with me ever since that time. And I think it's fair to say this is a measure that has generated both uh, enthusiasm and frustration, uh, with the latter probably refresh, reflecting that this measure is aggravatingly nonspecific, both in terms of its temporal resolution and in terms of its spatial resolution. So, you know, limitations of spatial resolution on EEG are really nothing new, but what's really interesting about the way in which EEG asymmetry is typically analyzed is that we summarize over a several minute resting period to get a single metric that's supposed to reflect some characteristic of the individual for that entire time. So we've tried to focus on improving both the spatial and temporal resolution. In terms of the spatial resolution, we've simply taken to using a current source density transformation and it attenuates widely distributed EEG sources. So when we're looking at, say, frontal electrodes, there's a much better chance that we're looking at activity that's generated locally, so we're really getting some index of frontal activity. Um, we've also taken a look at not analyzing the entire time, but looking for discrete bursts of asymmetrical activity within the ongoing record. And so in a recent paper, we found that by taking just 1% of the entire resting data stream, we accounted for 42% of the variance in the resting data in these asymmetry scores. And both the, the spatially and the temporally improved asymmetry scores um, were, they had the characteristics that might suggest they would be good indicators of risk for depression. We had a large data set of over 300 people, and these measures characterized, we, we saw a pattern of relatively less left frontal activity that characterized currently and previously depressed individuals didn't matter about their current clinical state and they differed from never depressed controls. So that's the kind of pattern that would suggest or at least be consistent with risk since it's not dependent on current clinical status. Hmm. Of course, a prospective study is what we need to do next to really confirm that. It, you could make the argument, well, this is just a residual or a scar effect of having once been depressed, but we're working on doing some prospective work in that regard as well. Well, it'll be exciting to see what's in store for the, the field of emotion uh, in this domain. And on that note, I'd actually like to ask you, sort of thinking more generally, what do you see in store for the future of emotion moving forward? Well, I think, as I've already mentioned, I'd like to see an increase in the realism and the intensity of emotion elicited by emotion researchers. Um, with the increase of the ambulatory assessment tools, psychophysiology in particular, um, this really, I think, brings us um, a great opportunity to move the assessment of emotion from relatively contrived laboratory studies to more realistic studies uh, in other contexts. And what advice would you have? I mean, students will be the future of emotion in many ways. So what advice would you have for students who are just now embarking into this field? Sure, sure. I'd say think big. Um, think outside the box. Think outside mm -hmm. the scanner. Think outside the laboratory. Um, I'd say get, get good and extensive training in sophisticated multivariate time series analysis because if we get the kind of real world data that I would envision it's going to be messy, it's going to be complicated, time varying, multi-channel kinds of information that we're going to need these kinds of statistical techniques to digest. And I guess the other thing I would say to a new person coming into this field or any field is um, don't forget to have a hobby. You know, this is emotion so why don't you find something that makes you happy. That's a nice way to conclude, finding something that makes you happy. Um, well, thank you again for joining us today, John. Uh, this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. John Allen from the University of Arizona. Thank you. Thanks so much.